Hello, and welcome to the show this evening. I'm Martin Willis, your host, and our guest is John Michael Greer. He is known out there as uh, JMG, so I'll probably be calling that a here and there. Um, he has a very interesting and comprehensive background. Uh, we're going to be talking about that. He has written another book. Uh, actually, I think he might have said two. I'm not 100%. I, I, think I just talked to him about it um, on UFOs um, and uh, the UFO Chronicles. And I think one was just called The UFO Phenomenon. Um, now he has a book, his latest one out of 50 books he's written. And this one's called The UFO Phenomenon, Fact, Fantasy, and Disinformation. Uh, wow. I like, uh, I like, uh, actually speaking to people who that are into a variety of topics and they kind of veer over into this very interesting one. I like to hear what they have to say about it. Um, so, uh, I believe this is going to be an interesting show. Uh, don't forget to check out our website, podcast UFO. And while you're there, you can check out this week's blog by Charles Lear and it's called UFO. Now, UFOs and automotive interference in Loveland, Texas. Um, a lot of people out there realize that this is a common thing that'll interfere, maybe electromagnetic. Uh, who knows what it is? But there are a lot of cases like this. But this happened back in November of 1957, actually November 2nd and 3rd in 1957. Um, and it's a great, uh, it's a great blog. Check it out. Uh, also, um, as I mentioned before, if you are on our podcast feed, wherever you get your, your podcasts, um, if you are on there, you get uh, an audio blog about midweek. And uh, so I encourage people to read the blog, of course, uh, because there's all kinds of links in them, but you'll get an audio blog read by the author himself, uh, Charles Lear. So um, it'll be right in your podcast feed. Uh, a few things about future shows. Um, if you have not watched the uh, body language panel on YouTube about people in the UFO field, I highly recommend it. There are some great episodes and they've looked into some noted people and their UFO stories. And that panel is most likely going to be on next week, the panel of four. Uh, this is where it gets tricky, though. They do what they do on Tuesday nights, and that's the only time they've been able to coordinate them all all four to get together, but they're going to try to work something out, but that will be between um, on YouTube live somewhere between Friday and Monday night. It will not be on Tuesday night, unfortunately, the regular time. However, we will have the audio file over to KGRA radio, and we'll also have the podcast come out at the usual time. But um, if you want to get a notification on when that show is going to play live, if you'd like to be in live and participate in chat and phone calls and all that. Um, so the way I would suggest to do that is you go either to my website, podcastufo.com, and on the right sidebar, you will see a mailing newsletter. Uh, you just pop your email in there, uh, click on the link, uh, click on it, and you will get a link in you that'll be sent to you in your email to confirm it. It's as simple as that, and you'll get our weekly newsletter, and it'll tell what time that is, what time and day that'll be playing. Or you also can subscribe to the YouTube channel, and you want to click on that little bell that's right next to the subscribe button. That bell will send you notifications and email of what uh, and when things are playing. And if it gets annoying, you can always click the bell again, and that, shut, that will shut it off. Um, as I mentioned, it'll be out. The podcast will be out um, on the regular time. Now, if they just can't get this together and can't make the show next week, I will have a family member of the Kelly Hopkinsville encounter um, at the regular time. So I uh, just had that as a backup. So that will be uh, that will be coming up. Now, um, if you watched Netflix Unsolved Mysteries, the Berkshire um, UFO, I love that. Um, and uh, Coming up, we have this gentleman on YouTube, you can see, uh, Tom Warner. Um, he's going to be on the Berkshire UFO. I get, I recently got him connected to Philip Mannell. He's writing a, uh, he wrote a book, and it looks uh, looks good that Philip's going to be uh, publishing that. And a uh, uh, great guy. I've spoken to him on the phone. And uh, so uh, he will be on September 1st. That's the 51st anniversary of that incident. So, um Anyway, uh, for some reason, my screen has frozen. I'm going to have to take myself out here in a minute. And uh, 
and uh, I, yes, I have to remove myself from the screen for a minute. I'm not sure how that happened, but uh, no calls tonight. I'm sorry. We just uh, we just can't uh, take calls the way we had to have our guests on this evening. However, um, in the chat room, if you want to pose a question, uh, I might miss it. So please use all caps for any questions that you have. And I'll be sure to, if it's an interesting enough question, I'll be sure to ask our guest that question. Um, getting back to uh, podcastufo.com, we have our Patreon link over there. And uh, I have done this painting. I think this is going to be my last UFO painting for a while. I lived out in, uh, in the Mill Valley area in California, actually a, a town called Tiburon. And I used to drive by this mountain. It's called Mount Tamalpais or Mount Tam. Everyone calls it Mount Tam. So this is a triangle UFO flying, not over the mountain, but between the mountain and the, uh, and myself, <laughs> as I would have painted. I actually painted this uh, on location and uh, at, just added the UFO to it. I think, uh, I think it's an interesting painting. So I hope you enjoy that. That It's not even up on our website, on my website yet, but if you go to podcastufo.com and on the sidebar and you click the uh, paintings uh, little banner there, it'll shoot you over and this should be up there in the next couple of days on the website. Uh, that is enough for me. And uh, welcome to the show, uh, John Michael Greer. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be on. Yes. Uh, well, I think you are a very interesting guy. I'm, I'm working. I'm just trying to get these uh, things down here. Just a second. Here we go. And I have to, what I have to do, if you could introduce yourself, I actually have to I have to take myself out of the stream and back in again because I'm frozen. So um, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself and I'll be, I'll be right back. Okay. Um, I'm John Michael Greer, as, as our host just said. Um, I'm a writer and a blogger and a researcher into a variety of strange things. Um, like I'm sure many, many of, our, of you listeners out there, I got interested in everything weird when I was a kid, when the world was just um, obviously the, the world that I was being told about by my teachers, parents, etc., was way too one-dimensional to be true. So, you know, I was a werewolf expert by age 11. I read um, a lot of stuff about UFOs, a lot of stuff about unexplained phenomena of all kinds, ended up getting very deeply into occultism. And um, one thing followed another. I ended up with a writing career, um, writing books on occultism, writing books on the future of industrial society, um, writing, doing a weekly blog, all that, all the usual stuff that you do if you want to make a living with your pen. Um, my research into UFOs began, of course, quite a long time ago. I, as I mentioned, I, I read all kinds of stuff that was coming out in the, in the early 1970s when I was a kid, when I was first getting interested in this stuff. And... The conclusions that I came to, it took, it took a long time for me to figure out what I think is actually going on here. The conclusions that I've come to are very different from those that are circulated either among the UFO believer community or among the, shall we call them the pseudo-skeptics, the, um, the people who insist that anything they themselves didn't see can't exist. Right. Um, <laughs> I hope I hope that uh, nobody will be too upset by my conclusions. I offer them, you know, as my conclusions. Your mileage may vary, but this is what I've seen. This is what I've found, and I think you'll find it interesting. Yeah, and and that's okay. Like I, I I've had I've actually I, I'm not really sure I what your conclusions are, but um, I want to of course talk about okay. them, and I'm I'm not afraid actually. Um, because um, you know I know a lot of people hold things really guarded, but I'm just plain old interested in the topic and different mm -hmm. people's thoughts on it. So I'm, I'm excited to hear, to hear that uh, you had first, you had uh, the UFO, I mean the UFO phenomenon. And actually after that, you changed it to UFO, the UFO Chronicles or the what UFO are the right that's titles? The yeah, that's the new version. Um, the UFO phenomenon was published um, quite a few years ago. I think it was 2009. And that had kind of the first draft of my, of, of my argument conclusions, such evidence as I had been able to gather at that point. Um, after the publisher let it go out of print, I placed it with another publisher, and he said, this is great. Can you expand it? <laughs> a year uh -huh. later, um, he got a much heftier manuscript with a great deal more information in it. Um, I didn't have to – I actually didn't have to modify my conclusions, but I had I, – I honed them. I got some explanations for things that I had not, that I had been still scratching my head, my head over, but it's been quite an adventure. And, and the thing, the, the, one of the things that I find most, most baffling really 
about how so many people relate to the UFO phenomenon is the idea that if it, it that it has to be one of two things. Either UFOs are spacecraft from other worlds, or you never saw them. They didn't exist. Um, that's a really odd belief if you if you stop and, and think about it. Um, why must it be yeah. only one of those two things? Ah, uh, yeah. But you're right. I mean, a lot of people do feel that way. And unfortunately, that's actually, in a way, that's actually hurt. Um, it's hurt the UFO field in general because or even the word, you know, the word UFO, people think tinfoil hats and, you know, crazy people. And, and a lot of people now, when they want to talk about the subject, they're using the word UAP, you know, uh, yeah. and j said just because of the stigma involved uh, with the UFO, you know, the rolling of the eyes or whatever. Oh, yeah. And the, the, the sad thing is that the term UFO came into being as a replacement, just the same kind of thing for flying saucer. Mm hmm. Because they were back in 47, 48, 49, flying saucer was the term that everyone used, and, and that got That's the right. eye rolls. And then, of course, the UFO investigating community came up with the idea of UFO, unidentified flying object, something in the air we can't identify. Nice. But then, of course, you know the same, the same dynamic played out. And I suspect 20, 30, 40 years from now, UAP is going to get the eye roll, and they'll have to come up with something else. Yeah. Well, I don't know. It, it feels like the... It feels like there's a lot of progress in um, in this, you know, this topic. You know, maybe I'm wrong, but, you know, when you get the government to actually um, take an accountability for, um, you know, their studies and now, uh, you know, a, a task force is being developed, you know, from the Pentagon to the Navy um, to study study UFOs, what they are and stuff like that. So it feels like there's forward movement lately. Um Every, for the last few years, there there may be there may be. I just remind you, this has happened before. Yes, yes, it and has. The whole, <laughs> the whole remember the whole product blue book fiasco. Um, the, I I would argue that there's a reason for that, and that um, the in particular the investigators who have realized the government is hiding something, and they're heavily involved in this whole business. They're actually onto something very very important. That's that's part of my part of my argument here, that. You know, there are mysterious things in the sky. They, people are seeing things, and there are, some of them are really quite strange. And the government is into it up to their eyeballs. But, of course, what, what, I've, been led, what I've been led to, the conclusion I've reached as a result of my studies, is that there's something that, that it's not what it's being claimed to be. It's not what it's being presented. And this whole notion that it has to be a little green man from Zeta or a little gray man from Zeta Reticuli, or it can't exist at all, is part of the camouflage. Hmm. So I don't I don't want to jump totally into the conclusion and the show's all over everything. <laughs> so I want to I, I want to you know I want to uh you know hear the pieces of it um and, and how you came upon your conclusions. Let's let's do that. Okay, the first thing, the, the, let, we, we can do this with a little bit historically, okay? Um, we can start with the genesis of the, of the, the flying saucer. We, you know, the, there's the original 1947 sightings um, and the flurry, the wave of sightings that, that followed immediately thereafter. Because it wasn't just, you know, the, the one guy in the airplane. Um, in the days immediately following his sighting, people all across America were looking up and noticing little silver dots moving through the sky. Many mm -hmm. of them were photographed. In fact, if you go back to old newspapers, sometimes you can find reproductions of the photographs. It's quite interesting. Little silver dots moving mm -hmm. always west to east. And, of course, it was in the middle of that that the whole the, the Roswell thing popped up. And the... Um, the or the arm the Army Air Corps as it was then the Air Force didn't quite exist yet announced that a flying saucer had crashed and then suddenly turned around and said no 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 nothing like that mm -hmm. and uh, people immediately said oh they have something to hide indeed they did so that was that that was kind of the seed time that was that was the beginning of the whole thing and it caused a a great deal of talk a great deal of concern um, it faded out. For a while, people weren't seeing anything, except here and there, you'd have somebody would see something odd in the sky. Then 
Okay, we're moving on to about um, the early 1950s. 1952 was the next really big flap. And all of a sudden, people are seeing things all over the place. There's a big sighting over Washington, D.C. Things are being tracked on radar. And the Air Force is making all kinds of claims about, no, no, there's nothing there. And then leaking stuff about how there's, you know, here are these radar things. There was a, there was a regulation passed. Um, a federal regulation which applied to all military personnel, airline pilots, and a variety of other people who were subject to certain national security regulations. And this rule had put a 10-year prison term for leaking information about UFOs. It wasn't, uh, let's see, I think it was in the 1980s that it was finally repealed. Now, here's the fascinating thing. All of these airline pilots, think of the, the Dash Fortenberry sightings, some of these others, Air, For Air Force and other military personnel, lots of these people who were reporting UFOs, none of them were ever charged under that regulation. Hmm. So very clearly something curious is going on here. You don't slap that kind of draconian penalty and then don't use it. So what was right. going on? Hmm. Okay, so 1954. The UFOs are all, are all over the place. People could go out in the, in the late 50s and early 60s, people could go out in certain areas for UFO watching parties. You would sit down and, you know, toward the toward evening, um, get a couple of beers, park yourself on a hill and watch the sky. And sooner or later, you see this little dot, which would fly past or would turn. It would glint. You couldn't really see it clearly because it was way up in the sky. But they were very predictable. You could find they, they were people could watch them very easily. And all this time, of course, the UFO research community was getting going. You had NICAP. Um, you had, um, oh, there were, there were a couple. I'm not forgetting the acronyms just at the moment. But there were, there were a variety of the early, very influential UFO research organizations. And mm -hmm. all of them were staffed by spooks. They were full of people from the U.S. intelligence community or U.S. intelligence assets who nobody, you know, who who were not necessarily known as such. Um, you had, you know, some very influential people um, in the UFO scene who were, in fact, um, working for the working for the CIA or one of the other things. At the same time, you have the emergence of the skeptic scene and people like Donald Menzel and so on, and they're all full of spooks too. So, the, you know, the, the, you, start, you start to get an idea of what's going on here. It is not necessarily what it appears to be. The intelligence community and the military in the U.S. are all over it. And there are things in the sky. Now, let's take a step back. What was actually going on in the sky at that time that nobody wanted to talk about? And this is where we start getting the conclusions. In 1947, the U.S. was conducting secret high-altitude balloon tests. We now know about them. They've been declassified. Project Mogul, Project Flying Cloud, half a dozen others. Um, they were they appeared when you saw them like a little silver dot in the air moving from right moving from, from west to east following the, the jet stream. Okay. Hmm. There were um, Project Mogul in particular was balloons with these big um, s structures to, to catch sound. The goal was to snoop on um, secret Russian nuclear tests. And all of a sudden, everyone's talking about UFOs. 1954 and thereafter, the U-2, the most secret airplane in the, in the world at that time, the most high altitude plane at that time, was flying at an altitude where, where people, nobody believed an airplane could go. Um, the, we now think of U-2s as painted black because they are. Back in those days, they were bare aluminum. At sunrise or sunset, you see one of those in the sky, it blazes like uh, a bright red orange light. And that was what people were going out and seeing on their UFO watching parties. Okay. Um, the SR-71 was being tested at the same time, utterly secret. The first couple of generations of U.S. spy satellites. Now, back in three years before the beginning of the UFO thing, um, World War II, D-Day is coming on, and the U.S. the U.S. military and the British military between them cooked up one of the biggest hoaxes in the history of warfare. Um, manufacturing a fake army right across the, the English Channel from, uh, from the Pas de Calais, the one particular part of France, to convince the Germans that that's where they were going to invade. And then, of course, they moved their actual armies further west and invaded in Normandy. They faked out the Germans completely. They had inflatable tanks. They had um, non-existent military units. They had teams of actors designed to, to make themselves look really busy to, to confuse aerial reconnaissance. It was brilliant. That same pattern of thought... I argue, 
is what gar- guided the manufacture of the UFO phenomenon. Basically, we need to hide these things from the Russians. What are we going to do? Well, we can't pretend there's nothing in the air. Okay, there's obviously something there. I know. Let's convince everyone that it's little green men from Mars. And that, I am convinced, that's not all that's going on with the UFO phenomenon. There are, well, one of the great problems with the phenomenon is that it's not just one thing. There's a variety of things happening. But one of the mm-hmm. core elements of the story is that U.S. Air Force intelligence in particular has been playing this thing from the beginning as a way to cover up its own, um, its own activities and to cover up what we're testing in the air. Um, here's another example. You mentioned triangle UFOs. Do you remember when those first showed up? Yeah, um, there. Well, uh, Dave Marler is what who you consider the expert. There have been some that have showed all the way back, uh, I believe, in the early twentieth century. Um, as yeah. far as um, as far as the masses of them starting um, uh, the, the late nineteen seventies, um, I know you know a few people personally that have seen them, like in nineteen seventy eight. There were a few of them. In the, there were a few of them in the very late nineteen seventies. They really took off in the nineteen eighties. What other black triangle was suddenly being was was of um, top secret military importance in right about that time? Stealth technology. Yeah, I thought you were going to say that. Um, exactly. Now, I, I, I do want to I do want to pause you right there though for a minute. Go, and, go ahead. Go ahead. I know I tend, yeah. to, I, I tend to I tend to get excited and run. Go ahead. <laughs> um, well, there's a lot of cases that. Um, mm-hmm. that something like this doesn't fit. So, and, and that's what I, I just want to bring up. And that is, uh, you know, for instance, thousands of people saw the Phoenix lights and that was miles, uh, miles wide, not, you know, oh, yeah. multiple miles wide. And, and uh, a lot of people say the same thing, you know, maybe there is a technology where they can uh, float with no sound and, and like anti-gravity or whatever it is they're doing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, when something is massive, you know, I just can't see, and, and a lot of people are are claiming to see things, you know, at least several hundred yards uh, wide and longer mm-hmm. and wider. Um, so that that's where it just is a, is a puzzle. In uh, there, go on, go on. No, that 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 doesn't fit okay. a lot of where no, I think no. you're going. Well, again, one of the, cr- the that's that's why I make the crucial point: the UFO, the UFO phenomenon is not just one thing. Yes, it's basically what we've got going on here is a situation where there is the the let's 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 talk about let's let's say there's a social phenomenon called the UFO. We all have that image of the flying saucer in our minds. Um, we've all we we all grew up at this point with the idea of little green men and flying saucers from Mars or what have you, as part of our culture, part of one of our cultural myths, if you will. And so around that set of images, various different groups of people have been manipulating those things. And there may be other things entirely unrelated to um, people that also have something to do with this. One of the things that, that I think has really gotten misplaced in the, in the whole um, the recent UFO research generally, again, it's getting stuck in that notion that, it, that a UFO has to be an alien spacecraft or it never existed at all. Back in the 1950s, there, were, there was a lot of much more, um, much more flexible, much more open. You know, what could these things be? Um, there were there were there were several people who proposed they might be living things in the upper atmosphere. There were um, there were theories that they were coming from um, the oceans. Ivan Sanderson wrote a fascinating book about that. And broadly speaking, um, I think I think in some ways in those days we were closer to the answers precisely because people were not stuck on one answer for everything. The the, the thing that I've been talking about, the series of disinformation campaigns carried out uh, first by U.S. military intelligence, and then more generally as other countries got into the, got, got into the shtick, um, that's one important thread. It's not the whole story, but it's a very important thread. And watch, if you watch some of the important cases, like the whole Paul, Paul Benevitz thing. Um, oh yeah, mm-hmm. he was fed. You know, way he was fed disinformation by Air Force intelligence, and yeah. literally driven insane. Ended up in right. an asylum because they just they they you know fed him all of this bizarre paranoiac stuff, all of which ended up getting retailed into the broader UFO community. Um, 
that's a classic example. Um, the evidence that I found that I cover in my book shows that what happened there is that Benowitz, without, without realizing it, he was trying to research UFOs. He actually ended up snooping on um, top secret projects at, San, at the Sandia Laboratories. Right. And so the intelligence services said, I know how to fix this, and proceeded to, say, to feed him gibberish until he cracked so he so they could distract him from what was actually going on and so that's a great example of again one of the threads that's going on here um but the thing is it's a weird the whole ufo thing it's very strange and it's never it's not you can't just flatten it out into a single answer yes i think uh, that's kind of one of the things that keeps me really fascinated by it because uh you know i've said many times in the show i feel like i I know less than when I started, you know, almost nine years ago, but um, because it is, and I, I do agree a hundred percent. There isn't just um, one answer and there could be many answers and they could be answers to some of it. We wouldn't even understand. Um, That's a very good point. Going back to the triangles though, you were going somewhere with that about the stealth, uh, the stealth fighters. Okay. Stealth fighter, stealth bomber, a um, couple of other airplanes that are still top secret, uh, the TR-3 Black Manta, which is tactical reconnaissance, and the, uh, the SR-92 Aurora, um, an, another big big triangular stealth plane. It's been sighted a couple of times. Never quite, never, no one's managed to photograph it yet, but um, respected authorities say that it exists. Um, it doesn't get out much because it uses extremely complex, um, extremely expensive technology. It takes like a million dollars a flight to keep that puppy in the air. Wow. So we didn't see much of it. Do you remember when the SR-71 was retired and it spent about a, um, about 10 years being mothballed and then all of a sudden we were using SR-71s again? That's when the Aurora finally became, it became obvious the Aurora was simply too expensive to use. So we have these stealth planes, but we also have these black triangles that kind of drift slowly by at not much more than treetop level. Um, May you know some people listening hear a very faint buzz as those, a small engine is going. Other people don't hear anything at all. They're outlined with lights. Um, if you get a good view of them, you may see a kind of framework that the lights are connected to. What exactly that is is a fascinating question. But the U.S. government has been doing research into airships, lighter than air airships, for quite some time now. Oh, yeah. And my guess is what is what happens is that at least some of those black triangles. That's what they are. And are they actually a military technology or anything? No, they're there to fake people out. They're part of the, they're like the inflatable tanks yeah. around over. So you get, you get basically a big airship with a lot of bright lights and you cruise it over a freeway. So a thousand people see it. Okay. Now we have, um, let's call him Boris Badenov. We have a Russian spy. He wants to find out about these, these weird, these weird stories about black triangle, black triangular aircraft. What is, what are, is the U S up to? And, most of what he hears about are these slow floating things that go drifting all over, you know, Westchester, New York, or what have you. Um, he's going to be hopelessly confused. He's not going to be able to get through that to the through that noise to the signal, which is that we've got a stealth, we've got a working stealth technology, and they don't. So it's always necessary in this in this sort of thing to say, okay, who be faking what, and what will, what will they be covering by it? And so that's that's basically where, where I was going there. We have the stealth planes, the ones that are that are publicly admitted, the ones that are still top secret. Um, we have something else, which is, is of course very secret, which is drifting along uh, at, at treetop level, freaking people out on highways and, and gathering crowds of thousands, um, drawing as much attention to itself as possible. You, you'll notice that a lot of the the, the slow moving black triangle things they go out of their way to be seen. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you. Um, you know, a lot of people will, will you know, make a suggestion, well, um, their military possibly, you know, trying to fly over populated areas. So um, just to see what the public reaction is. I've heard that. I've heard that mm -hmm. argument a, a number of times. Yeah. But, um, yeah, uh, but I, I don't think it's just for the public reaction. Go on. No, 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 no. Finish your thought on that. I have a question I wanted no, to pull up on chat. It's it's not it's not it's not public reaction. It's distraction. Uh, you know, if you ever watch a stage magician, 
when he's going about to do something with his left hand, he makes these big gestures with his right hand. So everyone's looking at the right hand. Nobody yeah. watches him pull the extra ace out of his pocket. That's what's going on here. You have to source the disinformation. Watch where things are coming out. Now, again, this will not solve all the all UFO cases, but if we can get the Air Force out of the picture, if we can figure out what has been manufactured as disinformation, sweep that aside, we have a better shot at understanding the, what's left of the picture. Now, go on. You got a question? Yeah, that that makes a makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'll say, uh, Mary Grace has this question for you. Those little, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, you were talking about earlier, those little shiny dots in the sky during the 1950s and 1960s, could they have been the palladium spheres attached to balloons? I'm not sure what palladium spheres are. Actually, that's that's primarily, that, yes, that, um, palladium is, is, a, is a rare metal. And um, they were using it to coat various things in um, in some of the various secret tests that they were doing. It's very reflective. And so, um, yeah, that actually is probably one of the things that was spotted in the, 19, the, the late 1940s and early 1950s when we were doing all these top secret balloon tests. So, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, I'll, I'm going to keep an eye on uh, chat and uh and if oh, I see a do. good question, I'll pop that in there and, and uh, ask you. Oh, that's um, great. So, all right. And, um, you know, I, I, you're right about also about the triangles uh, as far as, you know, what people have said. You know, some people do hear the buzzing sound. Um, I, I also had a, a, a friend that I was in contact with when she was a young girl, about nine or 10 years old, and uh, she's in her 30s now, and she was in, uh, she lives in Australia. And when she was out in the garden with her, I believe it was her grandmother, all of a sudden she felt this pressure, this pressure that like f almost forced her to the ground. She got down on the ground and felt an extreme pressure, just the sky darkened and she looked up and a big, huge triangle was like floating over her without any noise. And that's what got her uh, fascinated in the topic. Uh, now, did her grandmother see the triangle? Oh yeah, they both did. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's one of the one of the things that that also has to be peeled out of the UFO phenomenon. One of the other sources of of interest is we we as as a society, American society, modern Western industrial society, ignores human visionary experience. Okay. People see things things that are real on some planes, certainly most, you know, most other societies would say, well, you know, this is a spiritual thing, or this is, this is, this belongs to, to, to the other world. Um, Jacques Vallée, one of, of course, one of the great UFO researchers, um, his book, Passport to Magonia, which yeah. pointed out that an enormous amount of, of, well, certain aspects of UFO lore has exact equivalent in medieval fairy lore, come all the way down to abductions. And, you know, he just he just sort of put up the parallels. And th this is something uh, Patrick Harper in his book, Daimonic Reality, which is a must read, frankly. Um, he again points out we don't live in the kind of flat two dimensional prosaic world that we're taught we live in. Mm -hmm. We live in a world that is interpenetrated by strange things. And since most people in the industrial world have no way of understanding that because they've been taught not to. They've been taught um, a, a radically incomplete view of what the world is. If they have a visionary experience, what are they going to think of it? How are they going to interpret it? They, you know, this weird, they watched this weird thing move through the sky. Um, you know, 2,000 years ago, somebody would have looked at that and said, oh, you know, spirits are doing something or what have you. But they, all they have mm -hmm. to, all, the only explanation they have is, wow, that must have been aliens. Mm-hmm. No, I, so I that's that. that's an, that's another level of confusion. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I, I was I was agreeing with what you were saying. That's all. Yeah, yeah. So you know that's another that's another source of, of input, and it's not a. I would stress it's not a source of confusion. It's not something we should ignore. We should get away from. We should you know act like a skeptic and turn our backs on what people are actually seeing. Um, it's important. In traditional societies, when strange things were seen in the air, people paid attention to it. Scholars noted governments said, okay, what does that mean? Because these kind of visionary experiences, when they happen, they have a message. They're not just, they're, they're not just 
stuff that happens. Carl Jung understand that, understood that very well. Um, in his book on UFOs, he stressed that one way to understand them was as as a visionary experience, as something that people were encountering, these, these circular symbols of unity at a time when the world was divided down the middle between the communist and, and, and the West, communist bloc in the West. Um, these, these classic symbols of, of polarity and harmony at a time when you know, nations were threatening to blow each other up with nuclear bombs. And he basically psychoanalyzed the world using UFOs as the dreams. And that's another, that, to my mind, that's a very important part of the whole riddle, that we need to understand that the UFOs are one of the places where prosaic experience and visionary experience with the inside of our mind and the outside of our mind flow together. And so that's one of the things that makes it so interesting to me. It's not just out, you know, the truth is not just out there. The truth is inside us as well. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We had a, a guest uh, on not that long ago, maybe a month or two that uh, mm -hmm. was actually kind of going down the line where you're just talking about. Um, mm -hmm. I have a, a question up here uh, from Shawnee. And how mm -hmm. do you explain the interference with ICBMs? And uh, are you familiar with that, that uh, there has been, you know, uh, reactions and actions of UFOs over, you know, military uh, mm -hmm. uh, weapons okay. and things like that? The first thing the first thing to ask yourself is, where are you getting this information from? In every case that I don't know, you know, she can correct me if I'm wrong here, but in the cases of that that I know of, the, all of these reports are coming out of the military, from military personnel. Now, military personnel who speak about something like that without the um, approval of their officers are going to end up in the Who's Count. So you know that what they're saying is being approved by their superiors. That's one of the major sources of the disinformation we face because the, mili you know, the military is perfectly willing to have people say, wow, that must have been from outer space when they were testing something. Um, so always look for the source. Where is this information coming from? Who is generating it? Who is putting it out there? Because that, again, that's where you see the stage magician dip his hand in his pocket and pull out the extra ace. Yeah, you know, I don't know. You know, I know I know someone personally um, that mm -hmm. I talk to now and then, and I just can't see him as someone that would be deceiving people all these years. And and there mm -hmm. are some documents uh, that to back up some of these things uh, mm -hmm. too that have been, um, you know, have been uh, received through the Freedom of Information Act. Um, and, mm -hmm. and there's a there's a lot going on when it comes to. Um, UFOs and nukes, even uh, mm -hmm. uh, nuclear power plants, you know, and, and you name it. There's there's quite a bit uh, connected to the, that. That's a whole topic that deserves a good look. Yeah. In my nuclear opinion. power plants are another matter because there, again, though many of those sightings have not been personnel. Those have been like neighbors, people in the area. And that's another thing. And that's so, so that there again, look for your source. Now, I don't, obviously, I don't know the person that you know. I don't know, uh, you know, the basis for your assumption that, that they can be trusted. Um, you know, you may well be right. But it's a complicated world out there. And there are a lot of people playing some very complicated games in it. And, okay, just in, just in a case like this, since we're on this topic in particular, um, I do understand, like, if there's a, you know, there's a, a military issue, um, you know, a new craft that's out or something like that, that they, you know, they want to test and they maybe want to get a reaction or distract someone from seeing. But you want to make uh, sure those Russians and the Chinese don't figure out what it is. So, yeah. yeah. But then you have, um, you know, our weapons, uh, according to some, our weapons are, are messed with and altered. And uh, mm -hmm. this happened even in Russia, not just here, you know, it happened all over the, a lot of places in the country. Um, so this happens. Uh, there's no just there's nothing to distract anyone from. It doesn't make sense that the military would make up a story about something like this and and release something like this uh, because what could be distracting? There's no there's no secret stealth bomber that they're trying to hide when it comes to the you know nuclear uh, weapons being messed with. Well, actually, we don't know that. We don't know what they are testing in the way of, for example, um, anti-missile defense systems. Okay. Now, 
the nuclear rea- the nuclear reactors are, to my mind, the more interesting one, precisely because um, they're it's not coming from inside channels. It's coming from pe- from ordinary people who are simply witnessing it. But um, and you know, I, I'll, I'll certainly I'll certainly reconsider if I find if I find out that um, reports of UFOs apparently messing with ICBMs are coming from outside government channels. Um, anything. The thing to remember is anything that comes out of the government has to be suspect. You have to assume that they are, you know, they are telling you what they want you to think, not telling you what they know. And we've seen that so many times in so many places. And and, and that that skepticism toward anything that comes out of the government, especially when you know the the, the usual gimmick, the group of um, Air Force intelligence officers who say, "Well, we're members of a secret group that's opposed to UFO secrecy, and we're going to pass on to you all these secrets." And then we get the MJ-12 documents, we get the Project Aquarius documents, we get the Planet Serpo documents, um, all the same stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I I do. I, I do have to tell you, I do 100% agree with you that, um, you know, our government does, is not always truthful. There's many, many cases of that. No, uh, no, no government can ever be truthful. They've always got secrets to hide. <laughs> and, you know, they, they're, they're valid secrets. I mean, I don't particularly want the Russians and the Chinese to know exa- everything we've got. Um, that doesn't sound like a very good idea to me. Um, yeah, yeah. And every government also keeps harmful secrets. They want to c- conceal who's been dipping their hands to the public till and who wasted how much money on on such and such project because they were trying to, you know, bang the group, bang, you know, the the wife of the of the you know, the industrialist or something. All this, <laughs> all the, the tacky little secrets that every government ends up full of. Um, yeah, no governments are always hiding things. The question is, how do we get past that and and you know set those aside and say, okay, we can't really trust that. What are our other sources of information? And if we can pursue the UFO phenomenon that way and pick it apart into the into the different phenomena that are being lumped together here, I think it's possible to make some real headway. Yeah, very good. Let's go back to way way back, and that is to uh, Roswell. What's your opinion of Roswell? Okay, Roswell is a really complicated situation. Um, We know something happened there. Um, We know something crashed. Um, Most of the published accounts um, have been, are are, are frankly full of fiction. And I include the skeptic accounts as well as the believer accounts. If you look at, for example, what was the, Oh, I'm forgetting the the name of the the book in the in was it the early 19 the late 1970s that really put Roswell on the map. Yeah, um, like late 1970s. Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, Rolitz and yeah, two other more. Uh, yeah, more. more. Exactly. Yeah. Now the thing if the thing about that if you read that book and then you go to the fake crash at Aztec, New Mexico. And that was a complete that was a complete hoax that was come up with a couple of con, by a couple of confidence men was busted in the early 1950s. Um, Berlitz Moore et al. took details from the Az- from the account of the Aztec crash come up with with by those the two con men, and put them into their account of the Roswell thing. They literally padded it out with material from another source, and people have been repeating that uncritically ever since. Um, one of the real problems with the whole the animosity between the skeptics and, and the believers at this point is that. Both sides are so focused, become so focused on trying to prove prove a point that they don't do the necessary research. Um, my take: this is t- now this is tentative. This is this is quite tentative. But my take is that there was something that crashed at Roswell. It was probably one of the secret balloon tests. I don't think it was Project Mogul. That was the, that's the one that's usually been credited. The one with the big complicated hoo ha that was trying to uh, detect. Um, sound waves from from Russian nuclear tests. There were several things up there, uh, several things being tested high in, high in the atmosphere, and some of them remain secret to this day. Um, I think I know what one of them is. I don't know if this is what was being tested at Roswell, but or what crashed at Roswell during those, those tests. But <clears throat> you've got to put yourself in the, in the mind space of the late 1940s, early 1950s. This is before ICBMs. This was when nuclear weapons were delivered by bomber. Yeah. And when American military planners 
were petrified at the thought of the Russians. You know, the Russians have, have these huge factories. They can, they're turning out bombers at a fantastic pace. They've got the nuclear bomb. Or in the, in the late 1940s, they were about to get it. Everyone knew that. Um, and how do you stop them? We'd seen in World War II that um, fighter planes can can stop a lot of bombers, but they can't stop them all. And the last, you know, the, so the nightmare of American strategic planners in those days was uh, bomber streams coming over the pole from Russia, each one carrying a nuclear bomb, and how many of them would get through. So, the response to that is a program. It was a project. I'm, this is this is my theory. Okay, um, there was a project. This is fact called Operation Flying Cloud. Operation Flying Cloud was a project that was meant to loft atomic bombs on high altitude balloons. Hmm. Now, that's crazy for most purposes. You, you can't steer a high altitude balloon; it goes wherever it wants to. You you know, if you tried to use those to bomb Russia, you'd probably you'd you'd just likely hit another country. But there's one hideously effective use for that: lofting those bombs into um, a bomber stream. If you can imagine a new, an atomic bomb, a Hiroshima-sized bomb, going off in the middle of a bomber formation, uh, a millisecond later, all those bombers are scrapped, and their nuclear bombs are are blown to pieces. That's my theory of what was behind a lot of the a lot of the the balloon tests that are still secret. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, especially around 1952, we had come up with that as a last-ditch emergency defense in case the Russians attacked with nuclear weapons, in case they sent those bomber fleets. And it's still secret to this day, A, because it's still a backup, it's still available, and B, because to make it work, we probably would have had to launch the balloons over Canada. And in other words, what we're saying is we were prepared to nuke the Canadians in order to save the United States. And <laughs> can you imagine the international scandal if that came out? Mm-hmm. So, so basically, yeah, yeah. I don't know if it was a Project Flying Cloud thing that came, that crashed down, or something in the developmental stages of that that then ended up crashing at Roswell. That's one theory. It might have been Project Mogul. It might have been a balloon system, one of the balloon tests we haven't even heard about yet. But that's my guess of what actually happened. And then what happened after that, after Moore and Berlitz et al. picked up the Roswell thing, padded out with materials from the fa- from the Aztec fraud and ran with it, is that that became another place for disinformation. That became well, another place where people who had connections to U.S. Air Force intelligence could pad out the mythology and fill, fill in details and make it richer and more leverage so people would look at aliens and not at Project Flying Cloud. Well, here's my, well, here's my argument, argument um, for, that, mm-hmm. for that in particular. In particular. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's feedback. I'm going to just pull you out. You'll be able to hear me. Uh, so... This, uh, this, uh, it, it doesn't fit because in, in a way it doesn't fit. And that is because when this came, uh, out that, uh, you know, they captured a flying disc or flying saucer, and then they showed the, the balloon, they said it was just a weather balloon and all that. The story died. The story died for many, many years. And then uh, witnesses in the Roswell area uh, were contacted when this story became, you know, uh, back into the uh, stream. And so they were contacted, you know, directly and uh, former military and retired military and all that. So I don't see where you're talking about the Aztec crash, how that could have got mixed in since, you know, they were a few years apart and, uh, that story was already out on its own and Roswell was uh, sleeping for many, many years before it came back to life. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing, no, the point about, about the Aztec crash is specifically, if you read um, Burlitz Moore at all, if you read their, their groundbreaking, the book, the book that brought um, Roswell back into public awareness. Okay. And you go back and you read the accounts of the Aztec crash at the time, there was a book, of course, you'll find entire sections of prose that were the bullets that are literally lifted out of the Aztec book and plugged into their account. That's what I'm saying about the Aztec thing. And you're saying the witnesses of the, the people that plugged this in? No, I'm saying that um, I'm, I'm ta- again, I'm talking about Burlitz and Moore. And was it Kundera was the third author? I forget who the third author was, that they plugged it in. But how could they do that? I mean, what what access would they have? It's all to do that? No, uh, again, 
all they have to do is get a copy of the the book, uh, you, uh, Flying Saucer Crash at Aztec. I forget the exact title. It was something like that. It was a published book, okay? It was readily available. They doubtless had a copy. It was, I mean, I read it back in the day. And all they had to do was type, seg- type details out of book A into their manuscript. That's what I'm saying. It didn't have anything to do with witnesses at all. It had to do with writers who were more interested in the sensational story than in the facts. So you're saying people like Bill Moore and the other, the co-author are, that Bill, wrote the first book and eyeballs. Stan Friedman was involved in? Bill Moore was up to his eyeballs in Air Force intelligence. He's admitted I, it. Yeah, I, I, yeah that's, I know that. Repeatedly, yeah. he's admitted it. So again, what's your look for your source? As for Charles Berlitz, um, who was the primary author of the whole thing, um, <clears throat> let's just say that his, his literary output generally involved a lot of playing fast and loose with facts. Um, he, he was a sensationalist. He was good at it. He's really good at it. And if you, if you want to know how to write sensational literature, he, you know, his books are great. If you want to know the facts, don't use his stuff because, um, he would, he was like Eric Von Daniken, you know, another, another really good, really successful writer who loved to play fast and lose with the details. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a lot of people that have been interviewed um, mm-hmm. That you know, by uh, I, I believe it's six hundred witnesses, uh, supposedly in all, uh, that kind of share the same story. So, um, you know, I, I don't know how many firsthand witnesses there were actually, but there were a lot of them, supposedly that were interviewed um, in, in the beginning. Not not by just Bill Moore and his co-author, but Kevin Randall, um, uh, Don Schmidt, and um, mm-hmm. uh, I'm forgetting. Uh, just had him on oh, this I know, show. I know. There's been a whole series of, of of UFO believer interviews. There have also been, of course, quite a few interviews conducted by the other side, and it's very interesting to watch the the competing conclusions between them. Um, it's like a car wreck. We all know that when when ten people see see a car wreck, they present ten different um, ten different uh, statements. And if they've all watched, if they all happen to have watched repeated documentaries about car wrecks since, you know, since the time twenty years ago, whenever. Um, that's going to shape their stories. I, it's the, watching the, this whole thing become more and more elaborated um, has been it's it's intriguing to watch, and it would be really interesting to know what's going on behind it. Um, I just I don't find a lot of the claims that have been, um, in fact, mo- most of the claims that are currently being made about Roswell, I don't find them plausible. Um, and again. Your mileage may vary. I'm not saying you have to believe me. I'm saying this is my view. I think it's very possible, by the way, that there may have been um, there may have been corpses, that there may have been one or more people on board that was done in some of the balloon tests, and exact you know exact whether they were um, smaller than usual. I don't claim to know, but again, we don't know what exactly was being tested there. Um, no. We do. Know that there were a lot of balloon tests going on, a lot of exotic ones, and some of them are still very secret. Um, a lot, a number of people have said that they saw the debris field as this very large field. Uh, uh, I can't remember exactly the dimensions of it, but it was vast. And, you oh, know, yeah. this... Uh, whatever, whatever hit was big. Yeah, and is that the case in the uh, the cloud, uh, whatever the cloud balloon you mentioned? Did you know? but we, don't, we don't know. We literally have no idea how big those. It's all classified. It's all still classified. Yeah. I mean, something was being tested in the late '40s, and it's still under lock and key. Um, That's unusual, the, isn't it? For all this time to go it, by, it, and that... it's rather unusual. That's one of the things that's fascinating. But in fact, if you look up Operation Flying Cloud, if you look up um, U.S. balloon experiments, you'll find scattered references to Flying Cloud. So it was a definite. It, it actually existed. We just don't know what they were up to. Um, in the same way, um, pro- the Project Mogul, the the big the sound listening things, the super the the substructure for those, the sound concentrating structure was huge. It was very light, but it was huge because they were trying to catch, you know, shock waves from nuclear blasts in in you know the, in Siberia, coming at us over the pole. So they had these huge concentrating patterns leading into microphones that would also leave a large debris field. Interesting. Wow. Hey, well, we are ready to go into our break now. So we're going to have a break about about four minutes long. Now, during this break, if you're on YouTube 
and I, I'll actually keep this in the podcast as well. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be playing a clip for my good friend, uh, Alejandro Rojas. He uh, interviewed um, Luis uh, Alizondo, Luis Alizondo the other day, Lou Alizondo. <laughs> and uh, so I am going to play that clip. And uh, and also I'm on his show every Friday. So I try to be, I didn't actually make the last two, but we'll be right back um, on KGRA radio uh, right after these messages. And for YouTube, hang in there uh, for this clip. Now, uh, one of the topics that was brought up recently in the New York Times, and I know you, you've you spoken about this a little bit uh, on uh, Fox News, and I've asked you about this a couple of times, is the topic of UFO crashes. And uh, the way the New York Times framed it is that a couple of you at TTSA, or at least a few, are convinced that this is a reality, that this is something that's happened. Um, First of all, is that framing accurate? And, uh, you know, is that topic kind of been raised uh, also as a check to for these reports that, hey, you know, if there is something out there on this topic, we want you all to share that information as well? So let me go back to, to your original statement about there's people that, you know, an organization that are convinced. Um, and we've said this before. There's a fundamental difference between what someone believes, what someone thinks, and what someone knows. Right. So I don't ever want to cross that barrier of what I think. In fact, a few times I've been pushed, you know, to a corner on this question. I've tried very diligently to deflect because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what Luis Elizondo thinks or believes. What matters is what what the data shows. What do we have empirical data evidence that can speak for itself? Now, we know that this this planet we live on Earth is visited by extraterrestrials all the time. Now, wait, before I go down that road, people say, oh, my God, Luis saying aliens. We have meteorites and we have, have, have debris from comets on a daily basis coming in, re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, getting caught in Earth's gravity, coming in and, and plopping down here, sometimes in people's living rooms, believe it or not, right? So this is a, the universe is not static. Uh, it is dynamic. It is always changing. Things are always happening. Um, and so the question is, are the things, some of these things that are found here on this planet, engineered are they are they let's go the step beyond is it possible that some of these things that have been found that we know are not from this planet uh are they natural occurring things such as you know meteorites or whatnot meteorites or are these something that had some sort of intelligence behind them um if you will in their in their in their design and their function uh so that's the question and the bottom line is we're, we're still trying to answer that question. Uh, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm obviously deflecting your, your question here in, in, in the politest way mm -hmm. possible. Um, but I'm always very careful to, to stipulate what I think. Look, the Internet and social media is full of people of, of, of espousing what they think. And at the end of the day, I think most Americans are probably tired about hearing what about what other people think. Let's try to focus on, on the areas we don't know yet. And let's try to to provide information and data and evidence that can help us answer some of these questions. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard any of what I just said. Um, I apologize uh, because I was. I'm hearing I, that. Fine. Yeah, <laughs> I was talking, but I was. Uh, I was re removed from the screen, so I apologize for that, everyone. So I was just going to say that I, I didn't want to end the Roswell story right there because, um, you know, first of all, I have a feeling that we'll probably never really know what actually happened there. But um, are you open to the fact that, you know, maybe something else happened other than and than where you're going with this in particular? Basically, the thing is, all I can do is offer a hypothesis. That doesn't, I don't, I don't claim to know the truth of the subject. I wasn't there, you know? And so, did, might something else have happened? Yes. But I'm, what I'm thinking is that all the evidence suggests to me that what we're dealing with here is a balloon crash that has been systematically surrounded with um, deceptive camouflage to try to distract people's attention. That's my call. I don't claim to be omniscient. Could it be something else? I suppose so. But um, that's my best call as far as I can tell. Oh, uh, yeah. 
Well, uh, I don't know. Anything else you want to add about Roswell before we move on to something else? Uh, no. Roswell, one of the real problems with, with UFO research recently, to my mind, is there's been this endless focus on a very small number of old cases. In many cases, cases, you know, misusing, misrepeating the word, unfortunately, but in many cases, it's things that have been dug over and dug over and dug over an endless number of times. And we don't know, and probably never will know, in some of these cases, what happened there. Um, so this is one of the places where a broader view, I think, might be useful. So no, we, we, can, we can move on to something else if you like. Yeah, no, I was just looking to see if there's anything in the chat on on that yeah. um, on that in particular. You know, I I you know the the first thing that comes to mind is I always think, well, you know, why why would the Air Force even put that out there to begin? The Army Air Force put that out there to begin with. You know, the fact that mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know they say flying disc why? found. But, you know, you make the point or you have made the point a number of times that, you know, don't trust them because there it has to do with something else. And uh, that would be a good point, actually, in this particular yeah, case. They're saying, exactly. They're saying flying disc crashed rather than saying, um, oh, yes, this top secret um, military product of ours just crashed. And I'm sure they had to scramble around very fast to find a diffused weather balloon that they could, you know, display to the to the reporters the next day. Yeah. I mean, as uh, Stephen puts on, you know, the, on the chat here, why did the Air Force call the newspaper? You know, why did they call them in the first place? Uh, and that, you know, that does that that is something to be questioned because, you know, it's not like everyone in the world knew anything happened at all. Mm -hmm. But since people were seeing things ever since that the original sighting over Mount Rainier, um, since people were paying attention to things in the sky, feeding them with the idea that they're flying saucers rather than balloon tests would have been crucial just then, to, again, to distract the attention of the Russians. So this would have been if one of the, you know, a balloon test crashed there, there was probably some very, very fast um, conversations over the phone between Roswell and Washington, D.C. and somebody in Air Force Intelligence very high up says, tell him it's a flying disc. Tell him, you know, um, let's, let's, we, we, you heard, you heard this whole Kenel, Kenneth Arnold thing about flying saucers. Let's claim it's that. And from there, the whole thing developed. Yeah. I bet you're not saying in particular that you think Kenneth Arnold saw nothing or saw something that was, you know, a, a oh, potential cover-up? Saw something. No, I mean, the thing is, Kenneth Arnold, that, that's a good case to start with because Arnold was an experienced pilot. Um, he was exper an experienced spotter. He was used to, uh, you know, spotting um, fires, uh, forest fires from the sky. He knew how to observe. So when he said he saw something strange um, flying near Mount Rainier, we need to stop and say, okay, he saw something strange. What was it? good question. That's, you know, that's the really interesting question. What was it? Um, and now, now at this point that we're going to get into something a little strange here, because what he saw was not a disc. If you actually right. read his yes. account, and if you, you know, it was crescent shaped. It looked almost like, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was crescent shaped with a little point in the back. It was moving very quickly. There were, there was a flight of them. And Yet, because he th to him the the movement appeared to be like a stone or a plate. You know, if you throw a stone across the water, just right into the way it skips, mm -hmm. and that's you can do that with a saucer as well. And that's why he mentioned the word saucer. And all of a sudden, it was flying saucer. All yeah. of a sudden, it was flying disc. Now, here's where things get interesting because care to guess where um, the image of the flying disc came from and when it got started? Do you happen to know where the flying disc started? The idea of the flying disc, where that got going first, before 1947, long before 1947. Mm, nope, fiction. I can't think of where that would be. Science fiction. It was invented by um, science fiction cover artists for the early SF pulps. They started doing disc-shaped aircraft and then those turned to disc shaped spacecraft and it caught on it was fat it was a fat it was a fashion and so in the in the years leading up to 1947 
if you walk past a newsstand, you, you know, back in those days, you, you had newsstands just about everywhere. They had magazines, brightly colored covers. Um, you would probably, you had a very good chance of seeing a flying saucer on the cover of a science fiction magazine. And of course, there were lots of science fiction magazines in those days. That was the golden age of the, of the of the early golden age of the genre. And so this idea of disc-shaped aircraft really picked up, it became fashionable. You found all kinds of illustrations in them. Dating back to 1912, this idea got going in people's minds. And so when Kenneth Arnold saw a crescent-shaped aircraft, um, my theory is that it was actually a, um, a flying wing probably um, formerly German. They had a, if, you, if you looked at the image of the German flying wings, they have roughly that shape. Um, but but I'm, not, I'm not wedded to that um, explanation. It's just one possibility. But Kenneth Arnold saw a crescent shape, and all these people looking up in the sky in the days immediately after his report saw little silver, di little silver dots. Okay? But everyone thought they saw flying disks. Everyone thought they saw flying saucers because that's what they were prompted to see. And at this point, we're not talking the Air Force, but this is one of the things that um, I did. I had not been able to chase down at the time of the earlier um, book, The UFO Phenomenon, but in my current book, um, The UFO Chronicles, I was finally able to figure out what was going on there, why that idea of flying disks from other planets suddenly showing up all over the world, how that gone into public circulation before the UFOs were first sighted. Well, before Kenneth Arnold, I mean, we, we, we can talk in a little bit about um, things being seen in the sky dating back into prehistory because, of course, that happened. Um, it was deliberate. It was not done by the government. What, had, what happened was that in the um, immediately after World War II, immediately after Hiroshima, an enormous number of people were, of course, very worried that World War III would break out very soon and that we would all die. And a group of people involved in the, the, this kind of intersection between the science fiction scene and the occult scene. Raymond Palmer was at the heart of this, the legendary science fiction editor of Amazing Stories, later uh, founder of Fate Magazine, and so on. A group of people around him seemed to have come up with a plan of saturating the media with the idea that flying saucers were going to come and rescue us from the risk of nuclear war. Story after story after story after story saturated the pulp magazines all on that theme. There were, there were, there were hundreds of them. And cover illustrations showing you know, green aliens descending from flying saucers all over the place. They were literally priming the public imagination. Now, I don't think they were expecting what happened when, some, when Kenneth Arnold saw whatever it was he saw, and people started looking up and going, wow, look at those dots. Those must be those flying saucers you know, I read about in, in, in you know, Amazing Stories. But that's, that seems to be what happened, that it was literally, it was in effect an attempt to, um, to, keep, keep, to keep the world from blowing itself up by getting the idea out there that there were alien intelligence watching us that there were other beings from other worlds looking down at us. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really clever psychology. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, the existentialist philosopher, has this great um, piece in his, in his book, Being in Nothingness. You imagine yourself, imagine yourself um, at a keyhole. You're looking through a keyhole at something. Well, we don't have to add, talk about what you're looking at through the keyhole, but you're looking at something through the keyhole. All your attention is on, the, is on what's on the other side of the keyhole. Then all of a sudden you hear something behind you and you realize somebody's been watching you look through the keyhole. And all of a sudden, your entire state of mind changes. You're not paying attention to the keyhole. You're turning bright red because you know somebody just caught you. What Ray Palmer and um, the rain, me Lane and a range of other people who worked with them were trying to do was get that reaction. To get people going, oops, somebody's watching us. Maybe we shouldn't be so stupid about throwing nuclear bombs around. Did they succeed? We'll never know. Um, certainly, we're still here. But that's, that was the thing that I hadn't been able to trace down. The, what was it that primed the popular imagination to look for, for flying disks, to, to see anything in the sky and identify it as a flying disk for another planet? That this was, there was this organized attempt, using science fiction primarily, but motivated from within the occult community, to carry this thing out. It's an amazing story. Uh, again, it's covered in, in detail in my book, um, The UFO Chronicles. 
All right. Well, do you, um, you know, I mean, the, the sighting that I had, the only sighting that I think was, you know, really a solid sighting um, okay. was, was a disc, a disc right over my head, you know, with, with a light blue hue to it, uh, no sound, stopped, and then took an angle uh, toward toward Monterey uh, when I was out in California. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't, it sounds like you're going all, almost down the line of this is a pop culture phenomenon that influenced people. Um, but well, none, when I, when you're sitting not, there and your mind is, you know, I've been in a yeah. hot tub many times and relaxing and looking up at the, the satellites moving over and, and never uh -huh. even thinking about a UFO. And then all of a sudden exactly. that appears. And then there it is. Yeah. yeah. And, and no, this is, this is what, this is where you have to remember this, the sort of thing that, that Patrick Harper was talking about in demonic reality. We do not live in the prosaic universe we think we live in. And when, you, when I say something is a pop culture phenomenon, that doesn't mean that it's just limited to the pages of pop culture magazines. People experience these things. The crucial thing we have, that, that the thing the skeptics can't deal with is that people are actually seeing strange things in the sky. Now, in any, in any given case, can I be identify for sure what it is? No, not necessarily. Um, what did you see? I don't know. Um, I'm, per, I, I'm sure you saw something. And I'm sure it probably was basically, you know, a, a, a bluish disc that, um, you know, did an angle and zapped and zipped away. Many people have seen those. Um, that's where we start getting into the interesting part of the story, because that's something that is not pro almost certainly not being manufactured by the Air Force. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm not I have no idea what it was. I'm not claiming that it was, you know, aliens. I don't know what it was. But I sure know that it was something, and you know that's why I'm having this show right now. Was exactly. that that influence? Exactly, and that openness to, you know, to rem to remembering that UFO means unidentified flying object. Flying object, we don't know what it is. That, to my mind, is the thing that too many people lose in the in all the the backing and forthing about UFOs. That you know we don't know, and as long as we may we remain stuck on specific theories, we can't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I believe you're right. Uh, let me just see. Okay, so if someone wants to ask questions, uh, uh, Bo, you, you just put something in caps, but if someone wants to ask a question, please do it in all caps. Otherwise, um, just, just uh, you know, type along. There, there's a lot of interaction in, in the, uh, and, and uh, some of what you're saying is not real popular. I'll be, um, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> no, the, the thing is, I, I'm well aware that what I'm saying is a minority view, and I'm also well aware that I may or may not be right. But these are the conclusions that I've come to. And, you know, if other people want to pursue other avenues of inquiry, that's great. The last thing we need is a monoculture of ideas. And what do you think of, you know, Jay uh, posts up here, um, ask, ask you if, uh, if you believe it's possible that we're being visited and, and um, you know, from what I'm gathering, your story is, you know, maybe that's part of, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe that's part of, you know, the whole uh, puzzle. But, uh, but you think there's a lot of other things going on? Um, I'm quite sure there are a lot of other things going on. Are we being visited by... Um, other physical intelligent beings from different from from some distant planet. Um, I have no idea. There are some very good arguments against it, but you know one can't prove a negative. Um, I would want to see some solid evidence for it. There are many different kinds of you know one of one of the things that I picked up through my studies in the occult is an awareness that there are many different kinds of intelligent being, not all of whom have physical bodies, and so you know this, this we get into you know quote woo woo. Um, territory here, but it's territory again. There's not fully discussed in quite some detail in Passport to Magonia, and that, and of course, John Keel was all over that. And I think he, he John Keel, was really um, probably of all the UFO, the old UFO writers, he's the one that probably influenced me most strongly because right. his discussion of the super spectrum, of the idea of different modes of reality interpenetrating with ours, to my mind, that explains much more about the really high strangeness aspects of. Um, the UFO phenomenon than anything that we're seeing from um, the, or any any explanation that involves you know nuts and bolts spaceships being flown by by biological aliens. 
Yeah, we have a, a question up here uh, from Mary Grace again. Are you saying that people are hallucinating or that they are manifested it in their mind or have manifested it in their minds? Um, hallucination is one of those very awkward words that a lot of people, a lot of materialists use to explain things or to explain away things that they don't want to deal with. Um, I would say that people are perceiving things but they're not necessarily perceiving things through their physical senses. And, you know, the things are manifested in our minds. That's, that's a perfectly, that's a good way to say it really. But, um, you know, we, we have, we have various ways of perceiving things and the handful that are talked about in modern industrial society are not necessarily the most important. Now, what about, um, about some of your theories here, but when there's a, a mass sighting, you know, uh, and, and one of them, I'm just, uh, someone put this up, O'Hare, uh, Andy, who calls in, um, can't, unfortunately, no calls today. But uh, O'Hare, I don't know if you ever checked into Gate C-17 back in 2006 um, when there was a, a disc over O'Hare and they had there to was, halt. There was certainly something that a lot of people saw, yes. Yeah. Um, my basic assumption, and this is this is a starting point. This is not a conclusion. It's a starting assumption, is that when you see a when you have a mass sighting, when you have um, dozens or hundreds of people spotting the same thing and they describe it the same way, you're dealing with something that's physically there. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with something where one person perceives it, another don't, where you know somebody perceives it alone, or where there's a lot of really high strangeness going on that looks like visionary experience, then it's probably something on the visionary end rather than something on the physical end. So whatever was above O'Hare, there apparently was indeed something physical up there. What was it? Good question. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that is a real good case. And it's, it was kind of, you know, uh, um, it was, I don't want to say covered up, but uh, you just were not be able to, no one could be interviewed for that or, or very few people could. I, um, I really think that something got spotted that was not supposed to be spotted. Yeah. And so there was an immediate, oop, covered, the, you know, no interviews, no information, no, you know, we, we no comment. Yeah. Uh, Mark has a, a, a statement and a question. I agree with him about Valley and Keel's ultra terrestrial explanations are more accurate than most UFO community want to see and really examine. I think it's often along those lines. Oh, that was just a statement all the way through. I thought there was, oh, here was the question right here. Um, what about radar hits of unknown objects uh, through the years, the testimony of commercial pilots, et cetera? Okay. Um, the test, and first of all, you have to ask, where are you getting the information from the radar hits? If it's coming from the military, don't trust it. If it's coming from civilian airline pilots, pay attention to the regulations that govern civilian airline pilots. They're actually subject to military discipline, or they were up until the 1980s. They were subject to the regulations that I mentioned that made speaking out about UFOs um, a federal offense that could get you 10 years in the slammer. And yet cases like the Nash Fordenberry sighting, you know, two commercial airline pilots who were governed by that regulation, and they talk to the news and they talk to the media all over the place. Many of these, I am convinced that many of these things were faked, that many of the things they were, they, you know, it was their patriotic duty to help spread disinformation. So somebody from Air Force Intelligence came to them and said, uh, we want you to do something for us, you know, for your country that do not, you know, we are not going to answer too many questions, but this is what you're going to say you saw. Um, in the, especially in the 1950s, in the middle of the Red Scare and so on, people, we know we know for a fact that people did that in other contexts. So there was a lot of false stories being spread, things like that, to, to confuse the Russians and so on. And I think that's a lot of what was going on there. Always, always, what's your source? Look for the source. That's where you see the magician dipping his hand into his pocket. And if it again, if it comes from the government, if it comes from the military, if it comes from anybody who is subject to military discipline as commercial airline pilots, um, think twice. Be aware that you may be being you may be being fed what they want you to think and not what actually happened. All right. Well, let's go into the Rendlesham Forest for a case. That's uh, a great. One. Yeah, happened back in 1980. Now I know Charles Hald. I know uh, a few other people that uh, were firsthand witnesses to that. And mm -hmm. you know, military again. You're talking military. But here's here's the catch in 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 your your theory and in, in this in particular is that um, they didn't want that leaked. 
You know, I mean, Charles Halt told me, you know, the best thing that could have ever happened in his life is that, you know, that story was never leaked. And, you know, he, his mm -hmm. tape, his tape didn't get out of there. there's, you know, audio tape that he recorded during the incident. No, that was that was not supposed to come out because um, let's let's take a step back from that. What happened at Reynolds from Forest? We have um, two um, RAF bases leased to the U.S. Air Force. OK, mm -hmm. we have that night an unidentified radar blip coming in fast. We have all kinds of evidence that something crashed, something made an emergency landing, something that was described as, drumbeat please, a black triangle. What was going on in 1980? Again, early stealth. So Over Mike, there, though? What? In England? Tested in England? Uh -huh. No, at that, that point we're past the we're past immediate test bed. There's 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 some interesting timing. I think it was set by '78 was when the st the, te the stealth technology was really solidly in place, and yet it wasn't until '82 that the F-117, the first uh, stealth fighter, finally flew. This is skunk works. These are people who got the U-2 in the air in 18 months. So what were they making between the two? The usual guess among people who research this is that it was the TR-3 Black Manta. It's another stealth plane. It's a reconnaissance plane, long-range recon. Um, and this was an early mission. They had, they had some kind of mechanical, some kind of problems over the North Sea. They were perhaps going to be snooping on the Russians. It's a popular, popular thing to do in, 19, in, in, in 1980. So they have to make an emergency landing. They make the emergency landing in England because that's close. And... At that point, this entire stealth thing was, com was, was really the deepest secret we had, and it could have been exposed by a single photograph because all of the disinformation that was, I mean, people were talking about stealth in those days, but all the disinformation was, to, was about like secret paints and secret substances made for the, um, you know, of the wings and, and the fuselage and so on, and that wasn't what was doing it. As we know, it was the, the specially angled surfaces that reflected radar waves away. One photograph would have blown that secret sky high. And so, yeah, a black triangle crash landed. And the U.S. military was, and, and the British military were desperately trying to keep that information from getting out. Once it leaked out, of course, they had to cover it up in flying saucer colors as quickly as possible. Mm, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not... I'm I don't, I don't think I, I buy this 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 part okay, of it. You know, I, and, and you know, just just talking to Charles Halt from one of them, the commander. Uh, 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 he wasn't the commander of the base at the time, but uh, mm -hmm. but anyway, uh, assistant mm -hmm. commander. Of, I, I don't remember his title in my book. Yeah, yeah. But um, but um, he, here's the thing. So he he has. You know, I've I've been face to face with him talking. Uh, I feel like I have a a pretty good. Uh, observation if someone's telling phony baloney or not you know of course um you know anyone can be fooled but he tells a story of uh, this thing looking like an eyeball and going through the woods and kind of like you know bouncing between the trees and then all of a sudden it bursts into several lights and uh you know he said it doesn't it doesn't make any sense at all and you know i i have a friend in the antiques world who actually saw a UFO in college that was box shaped, came down through the mall at uh, Amherst College. He was in the tower and the thing looked like a box and then it shot up um, overhead toward the mountains and then it burst into lights. So there's two stories into five lights, two stories right there um, that are very you know similar in that type of way. But um, I, I don't know, uh, you know, the, the audio of that, it sounds, pretty fascinating. It sounds uh, like something was really going on. Did you listen to the audio as well? I have not listened to the audio. Yeah. Uh, it's really worth, uh, really worth checking out. It doesn't, yeah. I don't, I don't see how that could have been faked or why it would have been. Mm, well, again, if you want people to believe that it's, that it's, that it's aliens and not stealth technology, if you, and you have the resources of the U S government, you can do a lot of fakery. You All right. Well. So he wrote this memo about the the whole situation. And it was secret memo that he he sent to headquarters. Um, you know that later uh, was revealed. It had no intention of being revealed at the time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, and, and and there's a number of cases where 
you know, something eventually becomes declassified. It just seems like if this was a disinformation effort, then immediately um, that document would get out there live and not, you know, years later when it's declassified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends. It depends very much. On, I mean, the thing is, we're sitting here outside. The, you know, we're sitting here on the outside trying to look in and exactly what's going on, exactly who's to, who's talking about what or what's being manufactured at what time, what purposes is being manufactured for. We can't know that. What I'm saying, though, is that a great many cases uh, that have been labeled UFOs show, re show basically they make very immediate sense if we look at them and say, OK, what's the Air Force using this to distract attention for something from something? And I argue the answer is yes. In a, very, in a very large number of cases, that's what's going on. That in not all the cases, again, there is no one explanation for all UFO phenomena. But if we can, if we can catch, to get a sense of how Air Force intelligence is, is manipulating their end of it and screen that interference out, we have a much better chance of getting toward what was actually going on. As a working rule, as I've noted, if it comes from a, a president or former military officer or somebody in this, in you know, somebody with connections to Spookwood, I discount it precisely because there, you know, you can't know whether they're telling the truth or not, and that may be a mistake on my part, but I don't, I don't see any way around that because the. Um, especially Air Force Intelligence, they have floated so much nonsense. I talked about the Benowitz case earlier. You know, they've done that kind of thing over and over again. And they're still doing it. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you fool me once, what's the phrase? You fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So anything that comes from a military source, a government source like that, you've got to look at it skeptically. You've got to say, okay, what, you know, are they hiding something? Yes. What might they be hiding with this? What strategies might this be involved in? We, and th this is actually another thing that Jacques Wallet makes in his in his book Messengers of Deception, that um, you know just as just as Hitler's generals had ninety percent of the information they needed to realize the Allies were going to invade Normandy, but they had the wrong ninety percent. And Valet goes on and points out it's exactly the same thing. We have 90% of the information about the UFOs about that would help us figure out what's actually going on, but it's the wrong 90%. And we also have a lot of disinformation, as he pointed out, a lot of stuff that is, um, that is very dubious, that is manufactured, that is meant to push the narrative this way or that way. Uh, I mentioned the MJ-12 business. Um, and and that ha that, the reality of that has to be taken into account. Otherwise, we're just wandering in the mist. So getting back to just the Rendlesham um, really quickly, um, the question comes up, the UFO was not big enough for a pilot. It was very small, according to, you know, Jim Penniston. And um, I, uh, it, it was very small for a pilot. I believe it was like six by nine or something like that and, and not too tall. And it, it took off again. You know, this, this, are you saying that all these military people are in on the, you know, this big, uh, that, uh, that claim that it was very small fascinates me because the the material that I read, and I read quite a few books on the subject, including a number by, by you know, I read Jenny Randall's book, for example. Um, the claim was, that the, the, the claim they reported, that it was something rather large, a large triangular um, aircraft slash spacecraft. Well, you know what? Okay, well, then there's the we, three we indentations. We're talking multiple stories here. And that that adds to the fun, of course, when there there are conflicting stories in circulation. Go on. Uh, no, I I would be interested to know that other story. I I'm not familiar with that in particular. Um, but you know they they. Uh, you want to pick up you want to pick up Jan, Jenny Randall's book. Um, I think it's oh, I don't remember the title of it, but she, she's you know she's a well known British um, UFO researcher, and she did she did good work on this one. And I believe if I'm remembering it correctly, it was quite a large thing, and. Um, a whole bunch of people were taken to, were taken to see it in a way that later that some of them later said this this, this seems almost staged. So, well, yeah, I haven't heard that angle at all, but uh, I I will check it out and check, but, out, uh, check out Randall's book. I think I think you'll find it entertaining or interesting. And at the time, you know, Charles Halt made these impressions. I mean, he filled the impressions of the triangle 
you know, where the landing gear came down uh, with plaster. I actually saw he had a piece with him, uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. to, to show. And it, it did support the theory that the thing was very small. At, and it did come supposedly come down between the trees and branches broke and things like that. And they took pictures of the branches, broken branches in the upper part of the tree. And uh, they, it, it just, it, it seems like an awful lot of work to, uh, to, to make a hoax. No, again, the, my, my, my argument for Rendlesham is that it's not a hoax, that it was an actual stealth craft. And that's why they, they tried to blanket it so completely. I wonder, you know, that's, that's interesting if there may have been, because there were proposals in the, in the 60s and 70s to do what we now call drones, pilotless planes that were controlled by another plane. Um, uh, can, can you name some books that cover the small, that discuss the small thing that was found? No. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll dig into it, because um, that sounds interesting. And I think it, it, just comparing that to what we know of um, aerospace technology at that time might reveal a great deal. Okay. All right. Um, I, guess, I guess I'll move on also to mm -hmm. another, another question, just to ask you if you've ever looked into um, incidents like the aerial school incident in Westall. Are you familiar with uh, either one of those? That's not, that's not, those, those aren't ringing bells right now. Okay. All right. This was uh, school children in a remote area in uh, South Africa that, mm -hmm. uh, that you know, 62 of them actually um, talked about it and were interviewed by a child psychologist, John mm -hmm. Mack, uh, who came in. A BBC reporter came in first ahead of that. And uh, it's a very, very fascinating case. Uh, mm -hmm. We're a place where no one was... Uh, Actually, uh, the witness that I actually spoke with said, you know, she never even heard of the topic UFO. She had no idea what it was at the time, just that it was very strange. And there was actually beings uh, involved in that, too. And, not, and this is by 62 plus kids, plus one teacher, as well as some uh, unreported kindergarten uh, kids that saw it as well, but were not able to be interviewed at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that and, and the thing I want to cycle back to is that unquestionably weird things are being seen weird mm -hmm. things are being seen in the skies the question is what, you know, are they all the same thing I'm arguing that they're not are some of them being created uh, for various purposes of deception or um, basically are, are, are being interpreted in various ways manipulated by the US Air Force I would argue that's the case does that explain every sighting? Of course not. And I never, I, I specifically said it's not every sighting. But you know, one of the one of the challenges here, of course, is that to really under to really study every single sighting in the detail that would be necessary. Um, that's something that would take you know no no one no researcher can do that. No individual researcher. Um, we could have, if there was actually an independent agency for UFO research with, you know, a, a, a billion dollar year budget and hundreds of field investigators, even then, it would be very, very hard to keep track of everything and do all the adequate research. So all of us are basically trying to work with a very limited data set and yes. with other people's impressions, and we do our best. Yes, yes, I agree in that. Um, all right, well... Do you think so if the Pentagon actually admits that it has been looking into, you know, UAPs, as they call them, uh, whatever they are, you know, maybe they're because it's possible that it's a foreign threat or something else unexplained. And I don't know if you have followed any of that, but uh, oh, yeah. yeah. So uh, I did want to get into also the Nimitz case. Again, it's military. Um, you may have, you know, thoughts about that separately. Um, I talked to uh, Kevin Day actually uh, before he even came forward and actually he's, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's come out on, uh, you know, s several shows and, you know, TV and TV shows, mm -hmm. unex um, unexplained, unidentified and all that. So what do you think of these Tic Tacs that defied all the Tic Tac shaped, you know, UFOs defied all uh, physics that we know about as far as, you know, the start and stops and all the radar data they had on it and uh, uh, the eyewitnesses as well. Okay. Where does all the, this come into play? 
Good question. Um, the first point is, again, um, no, remind me of the date when that happened. Uh, uh, 2004. 2004. So right about the beginning of the latest run, um, when the Navy started going, oh, we're con-. and my assumption when all of this started coming out was, oh, the Navy's testing something new. And I could be wrong. But watching the Pentagon go through exactly the same maneuvers they went through in the creation of Project Blue Book um, and making the same, oh, well, there might be something up there, this kind of thing. It's so reminiscent of, of what was going on in the mid, mid, mid to late 1950s. And my assumption, again, I could be wrong, my assumption is that, that um, in particular now that our um, aircraft carrier fleet is is rapidly approaching obsolescence due to uh, ship killing missiles, hypersonic ship killing missiles. But the Navy's testing something, and they're doing a whole series of secret tests. They are trying to keep it out of the eyes of everyone, and so they are manufacturing and circulating stories of you, this UFO, that UFO, the other UFO, as protective camouflage, just the same way that the Air Force did. Now, again, I could be wrong. That's my take on it. And watching the Pentagon pile into the whole UAP thing. Um, Again, I think it's a smokescreen. I think it's. I think we're looking at another equivalent of those inflatable tanks and non-existent armies that we used to fake out the Nazis in, in 1944. And um, will I, you know, will I be able to say that for sure? Not until whatever the Navy, you know, my my working guess is in about ten years, maybe five, but probably closer to ten, given the way it goes. We'll find out that the Navy does have this remarkable new technology that they haven't been talking about and it will resemble what's being seen in roughly the same way that the stealth planes resembled those uh, slow moving black triangles you know we'll see i quite understand there are a lot of people who think otherwise who think that it's something the violet you know there's some um something violating the laws of physics some some you know alien technology or something and we'll just have to see who's right now the government recently over this uh, last few months has uh, come out and said that they agree that the three videos that have been released were, you know, unidentified uh, objects. And, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, they, they – oops, I'm sorry. Uh, I put up the wrong – here's the one. Um, but there was the, – the shapes were – there was the gimbal known as the gimbal where this – uh, mm-hmm. This disc with a little point on the top it appears to have a point. It kind of goes along level, and then all of a sudden it goes up on its side, and it's moving along at a hundred some odd knots, and uh, you know being filmed with the gun camera and all that. Um, mm-hmm. And then the go fast, which was a lock on, and uh, then of course the tic tac that came off of that whole event off the coast of of California. Um, mm-hmm. And what do you what do you say to all those different objects and all that? You think they're all a, a military? I mean, you think this is the total no, answer for I this? Think, no, I think I think that I think that, that what we that um, all those films were clever fakes. That all those, I mean, the, this is the U.S. government. Can they pay for the cons- the production of a film? And then leak it and say, wow, this must be unidentified. If they're trying to cover up something that doesn't look like any of those, of course they can. So again, there, anything that comes from the government, you have to approach with skepticism. Because again, they're not telling you what they know. They're telling you what they want you to believe. Mm-hmm. Well, um, that's my take. Again, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying that I'm, that I'm omniscient here or that I'm absolutely true and, you know, you, you, better, you better believe it. This is my take. And it's, it's worked out that way often enough. It's worked out often enough that the, um, the remarkable thing in the sky that so-and-so is pointing to turns out 10 or 15 years down the road to have been another secret test. You remember the, the Mantel case that used to be quite famous? Uh, 1948, um, Air, Air National Guard pilot went chasing a, a cone-shaped UFO, and it, he ran too high, uh, lost uh, lost consciousness due to lack of oxygen. Oh, yeah. Crap. And uh, yeah, and it turned out that what he was chasing was um, a skyhook balloon. One of the again, one of those balloon tests. But for like what was it, six years after um, after the date of that of that crash, the Air Force insisted at the top of their lungs that no, he'd been chasing the planet Venus. 
Right. They know perfectly well that he hadn't been chasing the planet Venus. They knew that he was chasing a secret balloon test, but they lied through their teeth because those were the tests were secret. That was actually the incident that really gave me a clue to the whole thing. Watching, well, that and then all of the revelations about how many Project Blue Book sightings had actually been U2 and SR-71 sightings. Um, when that, when the information about about the SR-71 and U-2 program uh, programs were declassified by the CIA, it turned out that approximately half of the quote unknowns that the um, Blue Book had recorded, not only were they um, SR-71 or U-2 flights, but the Blue Book officers knew that they'd get on the phone to Langley, talk to the CIA, saying, "Hi, were you sent? Were you flying? Sent? Yeah, okay, mark that down as, unknown, as an unknown." So that's that's the kind of thing we're up against here, a situation where we can where the U.S. government is systematically lying about what people are seeing in order to cover up, uh, in order to provide cam protective camouflage for secret programs. It's you know it's documented that they've done that. It's, it's documented over and over again that they did exactly that. And so we need to look at any time. Something comes out of the government saying, and, and look at the possibility, or I would say the probability, that it's yet more of the same thing. Are you are you familiar with the Belgium wave? Um, date? Uh, I think it was in the nineteen nineties. Um, uh, that that was a, uh, I forget how many. I think it was something like a thousand sightings. I I may be way off on that, and um, I just wondered if you were familiar with that in particular. 1990s, and um, I I recall reading something about it, but I'm not recalling the details. What were people seeing? Uh, they were seeing a triangle. Um, uh -huh. uh, okay. uh, uh, lots of them, and uh, police well, officers. Well, a round triangle or a flying up high triangle? Uh, they actually saw one over a field. Uh, that was uh, that was uh, the police officer in particular was out with his wife, mm -hmm. and that was actually in 1989 to 1990s when when mm -hmm. that happened. And uh, mm -hmm. so there was just lots and lots and lots of people seeing this. And one picture that is suspect, you know, only one picture was taken. And uh, that was uh, in That's June of 1990. Hold it. Yeah. What, where were all the cameras? I mean, 1990 cell phone cameras weren't really a thing yet, as I recall. No, but not at all. Yeah. People had cameras. And you'd yeah. think, especially if these things are being you know, popping up all over the place, you know, some lady would would stick an instamatic into her purse just to make sure to have it. But yeah, you know, one of the one of the really odd things is that, especially nowadays, with the fantastic number of people who are going around with cell phones with decent cameras. Yeah, I got to tell you, when I, I I will tell you this, and and I don't know if you have ever had a sighting. Of course, that's usually a question I ask. But um, when Actually, I it's a fair question, and I have to say the answer is no, I have not. Okay. Uh, when I had my UFO sighting, I was so enthralled with what the heck am I looking at? I, if I had a camera beside me, I don't know if I would have thought to pick it up. But I understand okay. what you're saying. If people, there's a flap, uh, everyone's talking about seeing something. You know, you're you're almost out there looking for something. I can understand, you know, your point where and, and, someone seemed yeah, to have the camera. Yeah, exactly. Some, you'd think somebody, I mean, a situation like yours, you're alone, you're chilling out in a hot tub, and then there's this this impossible thing hovering over you. Yeah, you're just going to be staring at the thing going, what the bleep? Yeah. But I think I said yeah, that, too. Yeah. I, I bet you did. <laughs> <laughs> no, the thing is, I, I, I have friends who've had sightings. Um, a good friend of mine's had, had, a, had a classic black triangle sighting. Um, and, and I believe he saw something. I do not think he was, you know, I, I, I believe that he, he saw it and he described it as best he could. And that's, that's the thing, you know, the, the thing that the skeptics always miss, that the people are actually seeing strange things in the sky. And we need to start by accepting that. And then we go on to say, okay, now, are they all the same thing? Clearly not. What categories do they fall into? Could they be from many different sources? What influence does popular culture have on our interpretation of these strange things that we're seeing? What about the interface between, you know, the interface that Jung talked about between the inner and the outer worlds where, you know, things are seen in the sky because they fill a psychological need, but they're actually being seen. You know, we're, we're not, again, Patrick Harper's discussion of demonic reality is great there. Um, we're dealing with a very, very strange phenomenon 
or a very, very strange set of phenomena. Um, as I've already indicated, I tend to think that um, John Keel's notion of the superspectrum of ultra-terrestrials rather than extraterrestrials has a lot going for it. It actually explains much more than many of the other explanations. Um, but there again, there are these other things going on that clearly relate to something like, say, military intelligence. So it's, it, you know, it's crucial not to, not to oversimplify it, not to try to go for the simple answer and, uh, and not to try to go for a single answer for something that obviously has many, many different causes. Right. Um, are you familiar with the JAL, the Japanese uh, Airlines Flight 1628 back in 1986? Um, I've read about it, but it was a long time ago. Yeah. Well, that's a fascinating case to me. You know, this walnut shaped, mm -hmm. um, you know, 300 some odd a foot or somewhere around there between 100 plus feet long, you know, following seen on radar. Uh, this is a, 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 a pilot that is flying um, cargo, you know, basically. And, you know, he, he uh, reports it trying to figure out what's happening. There's uh, all mm -hmm. kinds of uh, I think there's two different radar hits on this thing. And, you know, he ends up getting a, uh, a desk job, you know, after this thing happened because he actually, you know, uh, reported it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and what do you think of that in general? You know, John Callahan, uh, actually yeah. is a, a person that speaks about that, uh, now and what he saw. That's what I, I mean. Again, not not having not having the the actual account, the actual information, and so on, available to me right now. I don't know. Um, it's an it's an interesting question. I, I note that a, norm, a remarkable number of these sightings happen to cargo to people to pilots of cargo planes, not passenger planes. Yeah, there are now, some passengers. Matter of fact, I, the, I had a personal yeah, friend on my show that uh -huh. knew a commercial pilot that had a very similar sighting. He said it was shaped like a walnut as well. Hmm, interesting. And was that a pass passenger flight? That was a passenger flight, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I didn't say that all of them were commercial flights. I just noticed that a lot of the famous ones are are cargo flights. Uh, Nash Fortenberry is a great example. Ah, yeah. How about that? Never, mm -hmm. never, uh, mm -hmm. never thought of that. But yeah, they are, they are some fascinating cases. And it's just like you said, you know, we are, they are, there's some weird stuff up there. There's some weird stuff there's, people are saying there are. there's. That one over the English Channel that looked like big yellow crafts. So that's another great one. Unusual. Yeah. Um, I also like to, to point out, if you go back to Charles Fort, go back to some of the really early investigators, you go back to, the, in some cases, medieval and Renaissance sources, you can find descriptions of things very like what um, people are reporting now, um, you know, in things from the 14th century, in things from ancient Rome. There are, it's, it's really quite remarkable. Some of the weird things in the skies have been there all along. That's clear. Um, the question is, what does that mean? What does that tell us? I don't know, but it's, it's grist for the mill. It's something that has to be taken into account. When you, know, you occasionally get UFO researchers from the extraterrestrial side who are, who are insisting that, no, no, it's a, recent high, it's a recent event. They must have just arrived. And the evidence simply doesn't support that. They've been around whatever it is. It's been happening for a long time. Right. Yeah. Uh, just, just to let you know, we have, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe uh, four minutes, something like that left. Uh -huh. And um, your, your books, um, if you want to talk a little bit about um, where people can find them, actually, okay. and, uh, and, and a little bit, you know, just kind of what, what is in, you know, the, the, your latest book. Basically, what does it cover exactly? Okay, sure. sure. Um, as far as my books generally, you can get them from any full-service bookstore or your favorite online bookstore. I'm, I'm all over the place. Um, I've got an Amazon page if you want to look me up, John Michael Greer. Um, this current one, um, The UFO Chronicles, it's an attempt to um, sort out the UFO phenomenon, starting with the recognition that it has that it doesn't make any sense if we assume that if it wasn't a spacecraft, it couldn't have existed at all, which is the, the sort of skeptic and the, the skeptical notion. Um, it discusses the history of the UFO phenomenon, gives an overview of the whole thing, talks about the bad logic that a lot of skeptics use to try to pretend that people are not seeing what they're actually seeing. 
And then also talks about some of the mistakes that have been made from, by UFO investigators in interpreting what they're saying. And then goes on to suggest um, and some explanations for at least some of the phenomena. Um, the UFO Chronicle is from Eon, Eon Books. Um, it should be readily available, um, you know, at your favorite bookstore. And if not, you can you can get them to order it. I, uh, you just mentioned about you know some of the mistakes ufologists have made, and I know there's uh, you know I've brought, I've said this on this show a few times. It's unfortunate that sometimes and a few I can't I'm not going to say any examples or or. Mm -hmm. I, can't none can come directly to mind right now, but when they find out they're wrong about a case, um, they they don't divorce themselves from it. They they just keep going. Uh, they keep going with what they have, and and uh, you know even um, even to conferences, <laughs> and and talk about oh, yeah. yeah. So that that does happen. I mean, there's the human element in it. It's very yeah. human. If you committed yourself to a particular point of view, and then it turns out you're completely wrong about that that thing, it's really embarrassing to say, ouch, yeah, I was wrong. Um, yeah. The one thing I'll say is that generally speaking, the ufologists have done a better job at being reasonable, paying attention to the evidence and so on, than the skeptics. Um, one of the chapters in my book takes the, the basic skeptic arguments apart and shows that they're based on logical fallacies that are so old, they have names in Latin. <laughs> so these people who are crowing yeah. about science and reason apparently have not made the um, acquaintance of science and reason to the extent that anything like the extent they claim. And that's one of the points that I make. The skeptics have done very badly. They have, now, I think many of them have had reason to do so because a lot of them, again, have connections with the spook, with the spook world or with the Air Force. <laughs> Right, right. Well, okay. Um, that's it for the show with you tonight. Thank you so much. It, it's it's been a well, pleasure. Very much. interesting. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right, all right. You take care. And you too now. All right, all right, everyone. So uh, that is it for our show tonight. I just wanted to go into uh, what I mentioned earlier, and that is, uh, please uh, do either do one of two things. If you want to find out if if you're very interested in watching the show live, of course. Uh, next week, you want to go into the uh, YouTube and subscribe and click the bell and you'll get a notification because right now I don't know exactly when the show is going to be next week, the live show part of it, that is, if I do have the uh, body language panel up. Um, you can also go to my website, podcastufo.com, and over on the right-hand sidebar, you will see our weekly newsletter sign up. You drop your email in. It's very simple. And you'll get all notifications. Of course, you can be removed from the list. Same thing, you can remove yourself from the notifications on YouTube if it gets to be a pain for you. Um, and so that next week, it should be um, the body language panel talking about UFOs and UFO uh, reports and what they thought. And it's it's uh, pretty amazing. You, I think it'll be very enjoyable. And I think that is all I have for today. Uh, Again, check out the blog. Uh, you'll get an audio blog if you're in the podcast. And uh, we'll be back next week one way or the other. It might be the usual time with uh, someone from the uh, Hopkinsville uh, Kelly incident. Anyway, thanks so much. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky.